Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today is Wendy Welsh. Hi, Wendy. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, so thanks. I met you on Instagram and I was, sometimes I do that thing. I, I just go, I scroll through like my suggested posts and I wait until something catches my attention. And that's how I saw your account. Oh. And that was that teapot series that you have this flower sticking out of the teapot. And I was like, oh, I never seen anything like that. I have to look into the account. And then I opened your account and it's like the most colorful page that Instagram provided me with like lately. <laughs> oh, thank you. So how did you start this quilting? Like how long have you been doing quilting? Oh, um probably started myself well when I was about 15 I made something are uh, those English paper pieced hexagons a design called grandmother's garden I used to belong to girls brigade which is like girl guides um, and to earn one of the badges we had to do a craft and so I made a tiny baby blanket baby quilt out of these English paper pieced hexagons so that was when I was 15 but then I didn't never really did any more quilting until I was in my 30s and I'd had my two children and I just started to think well I um, didn't go back to work full time after I had my children so I had more time on my hands mm -hmm. and I thought quilting seems like a really nice hobby to get into and the shops are beautiful <laughs> so I was I started yeah really in my 30s about 20 years ago now so when you look back at your like first quilts in comparison to where you now like what comes to mind um still that I chose strong colors even back then um that very first one the fabrics weren't pure cotton which is what we all prefer for quilting now there was some polyester in those ones but I think um, my mum didn't want to spend a lot of money at the fabric store for a teenager to experiment so we just used what was on hand but um yeah I've always loved the colors the bright cut clear colors not um like a lot of people love William Morris traditional type fabrics or French General is another range that is primarily reds and creams and those kind of muted colors. But I um, prefer the brighter clear colors. Well, you also do this thing where you find a piece of fabric with some like large print on it and you place it in the center and then oh, yes. quilt around it. Is that something like a common technique or is that your approach to quilting? Oh, other people do that too, called fussy cutting. The um, <laughs> Tula Pink immediately comes to mind. She's a very popular modern quilt designer and she does quite large motifs, whether they're faces or animals and people don't want to cut the head off a fox or anything so they um strategically cut so they get the whole body of the animal or the whole face and that can really be quite striking too do you have like a, a preferred technique of quilting like when it comes to quilting do you have the designs that you always go back to or do you like to experiment with different things oh i like experimenting and trying Think some of my quilts take a long time, like more than two years, because they're made by hand, English paper pieced or hand pieced with a running stitch. But then sometimes I like to just make a quilt on the sewing machine with bigger pieces that I can sew up within a few weeks and actually get finished quite quickly. It's a bit like reading books you don't want to go straight on to another book by the same author you want to let that one sit for a while so you read something completely different a palette cleanser <laughs> well you also mentioned to me that you knit and you crochet as well um do you do the, do you use that as a palette cleanser not so much anymore I used to do quite a lot of knitting but um I've got rheumatoid arthritis and it really affects my hands the most and knitting it's just so um 
knitting for adults, like knitting for children was okay, but knitting for adults takes so long. I did start a lovely cardigan a year ago and it's still not finished. Um, I just, now a lot of the knitting's done in the round on the very long needle and I find it a bit depressing that it can take, I can only do two rows in one evening, that it's so long getting from the middle right across the back and back to the middle, where I'm used to knitting a back and, you know, you could probably do six or ten rows in an evening. This yeah. two rows in one night, it's like, oh, it's going to take forever. Well, you mentioned the rheumatoid arthritis and you've been living with it for over 20 years. Um, how do you manage, like when you have a chronic disease like that, that, and all you do is working with your hands, how do you manage it mentally, emotionally, and how do you like not overwork yourself so you are in pain? Like what's, what's your technique with that? Oh, um, well, number one, I stay on the drugs prescribed by the specialist, the rheumatologist. I take them every day, even when I'm feeling fine. I keep taking them because I know if I stop, it'll come back. And as for overworking, I um, did fall into that trap this year and I've vowed never to do it again, where my um, one of my fingers, this one here, swelled up a lot. And I really did struggle with that mentally, that I couldn't do any handwork in the evenings. I just watched television. It was so boring that I'm used to always having things on the go. Um, I took a lot of painkillers. Um, yeah, I had to have a steroid injection in the end, and that's come right. But I'm just telling myself not to overdo it again. I think that one was actually caused by the mouse on the computer doing too much of my day job, but it also is aggravated by too much cross stitch, hand piecing, quilting, hand quilting. So I I do have a lot of different projects on the go and I do rotate through them. And now it's become that I don't even do the same thing all evening. Um, I might do one row of knitting, some hand piecing and some cross stitch because they're all using different muscles and they use your hands in different ways. So I just need to listen to my body and stop before it gets bad. Right. Well, how much per day would you say you do something with your hands? Oh, <laughs> um, I usually, I have a part-time job that I work at from home it's on the computer so I do at least two hours a day most days for my job Monday to Friday and then usually after lunch I'm doing something with quilting um, might be hand quilting might be machine piecing a lot of time spent choosing fabrics because I do have um, a decent fabric stash at home and there's a lot of run upstairs, grab a pink piece that you think will be right, bring it down, go, oh, no, not quite. Go back up, try again. I should just bring the whole tub downstairs the first time, but I think I know what I'm doing, so I grab one. So there's up and down. There's so many stages to the quilting that um, I usually find something to do. Like I don't just sit down in an easy chair at 2 o'clock and that's it for the day. In the afternoon, I'm more preparing pieces for hand sewing in the evenings, like the cutting, the choosing. The um, I might do some hand quilting in the day because I tend to do that sitting at a table rather than on my lap. Some people hand quilt on their lap, but I prefer to rest the hoop on a table. So I sit upright in an office chair and quilt at a table. But yes, there's always something on the go. I was watching today your YouTube channel where you have instructional videos of how you do piecing and cutting and like spinning it together and working those tight corners, making the perfect creases. Is that part of the quilting that you love to have like the exactness of stitches, the exactness of corners? all those geometric shapes, like, is that your favorite part of the quilting, least favorite part of the quilting? 
I think that has become my favourite part. I really only learned to do the hand piecing about four years ago. I went to a class with a tutor from Australia called Jen Kingwell. And I love the relaxed nature of you can just cut these pieces in advance, pop them in a little pouch and take them along. If you're in the doctor's waiting room or you're at an airport or even on a plane, it's so portable. And it enables you to do these, what we call Y seams. So, um, you know, when it goes like that, it's very hard to machine a piece and pivot on a corner like this. So the hand piecing gives you accuracy that the machine doesn't so when you're doing odd shapes at tight angles. Right. How do you decide if the next quilt is going to be machine made or handmade? Like, do you prefer doing mostly by hand or do you like, do you switch in be between the two types? I switch because I don't want to have too many hand piecing ones on the go at once. That sort of gets overwhelming and you look at them and you think, oh, that one hasn't, nothing's happened on that one for three months. So I try to keep the number of each style that I'm doing to a manageable level of just say one or two hand piecing ones and one or two machine, say one or two machine piecing ones. There are some upstairs that I haven't touched for quite a while, over a year, sort of waiting for inspiration. Sometimes you see something like on Instagram or Facebook and you just think, oh, that would really work. That idea would really work with my quilt that's upstairs in the naughty bin. <laughs> <laughs> that I really, I'm a bit stuck on. I don't know what to do next. So much, yes, I gather lots of inspiration. Right. How much time do you spend planning a quilt versus actually sewing the quilt? Um, I spend quite a lot of time planning it because um, I know it's going to take me hours and hours and hours. And also it's money for the components and it's going to be time. I don't want to launch into something, cut up my precious fabrics and then realize, oh, I don't really like this. I don't enjoy doing it. So um, I have books, like a, quite a lot of quilting books on my bookshelf, probably 30 to 40 quilting books. There's book, quilts in there I've looked at for years. And in the next few weeks, I will devise a list of what I want to make in 2022. And I try and limit that list to about 10 quilts. Some are already started and in progress. But each year, I allow myself a few new ones to go on the list. And that's not to say if something brilliant comes out in 2022 and I want to jump straight in. I will. I won't let a list hold me back. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to plan and I don't just run around and start everything willy-nilly or I'd have 50 quilts in progress. Well, when you plan for the year, is that whatever catches your eye for that year? Like, can it be that there's like 10 quilts that will look almost identical or do you choose like completely different styles to create diversity of quilts for the year? They will be quite different, although... Last year, I put four quilts from the same book on there, on my list, but they're all done, they're different shapes, they're different patterns, but, and I do them in very different colorways. So one was bright yellow pinks, another one was just blue and white and very calm and serene. So you probably wouldn't even realize they were from the same book. Because the different um, authors have, designers have a wide range of quilts in their um, libraries as well. Right. Well, let's talk about fabric shopping. <laughs> uh, like you mentioned your stash, right? So like nowadays, when you go for to a fabric store, are you like very controlled? Like, do you know that you need like a couple pinks, couple yellows? or you go and like whatever speaks to you, you peek, like how does your shopping looks like? 
Well, sometimes I go because I need a specific fabric to be the border on a quilt because most quilts have borders to finish them off or the binding, which is the very edge to enclose it all neatly. Those kind of shops are clearly, I need something just for this purpose. And I try and only buy that. But usually when you go there, you see new fabric ranges released, things you've seen online. And it's like, oh, wow, it's finally here. I can see it in person. Oh, I love this. So it's tempting, always tempting. Then other times I just think, oh, it's like browsing in shops for clothes or um, I'd just rather browse in a fabric shop. So sometimes I go because it's been raining. <laughs> you know, I haven't bought anything, any new fabric for a while. So in those cases, I might buy fat quarters, which is a quarter of a yard. So um, fabrics are normally 42 inches wide. So when you do 42 inches wide by 30, a yard long, then they cut that piece into four and you can buy a fat quarter, which gives you a decent little piece to get a taste of the fabric. Right. And that's mainly what my stash is upstairs. It's fat quarters. Um, so yes, it's very tempting to buy new ones every time you go in a shop because they're only a few dollars each and they're a nice memento I mean not just a nice memento they're useful to go in future quilts because you don't know what's coming up well what do you think is the and you might not have the answer to that question but what do you think is the oldest specimen in that stash that you bought like years and years ago and it's still there waiting for its turn uh, there's possibly things that are 10 years old, but they're things that I don't even really like. I'm more keeping them as useful fillers. Um, I'm not one to just keep holding and holding and holding because it's too precious to cut up. I'd rather use it. And um, the more precious ones are probably only two or three years old and they're waiting for inspiration to strike of how to use them but yeah I'm there's some people who especially this Chula Pink designer some people keep her fabrics they keep them you can buy a whole fat quarter bundle it's called which is every fabric in a collection of which there could be 40 and these fat quarters come nicely folded and tied up with a ribbon. And some people buy cake stands and they display their fat quarters on a cake stand. <laughs> and they just look at that for 10 years. Yeah. And then other people turn around and eventually say, well, I'm going to have to sell this very precious bundle because I need the money. And um, they're going for massive prices on Facebook groups for these collectors I'm not into that at all I'm here to use it enjoy it see it in a quilt I'm not here to stash it away and make money on it in the future right well you mentioned that some of your quilts can take a couple of years to make mm -hmm. um, what happens to all the quilts that you make oh um Many of them are still here in my house because I haven't decided to part with them yet. Some have been given away. Um, I think I made a quilt for a friend's wedding as a wedding gift. I made one for my son. I've given some to charity causes. At our guild, we have a block of the month program and everybody gets the same pattern and directions on what colors to use. And we bring back all those blocks that the next meeting and one person wins them all and can take them home and assemble them into a quilt in whatever way they like. I've won that a couple of times and the quilts I've made from those blocks I've given away. Our guild is connected with a number of local charities and we give quilts to old people's homes, the hospice, 
the neonatal baby unit, the hospital's children's ward. So someone at Ad Ag Guild arranges all that distribution. So I've given some away that way. I haven't sold, oh, I've sold one because someone specifically asked me, but I haven't really got into selling them at the moment. Is that because you really want to keep them or is it because it's impossible to put a price tag on something like that? Oh, no, I could sell them. It's more that I want to keep them, but also that I've been asked to speak at various guilds throughout New Zealand and they want to see what I've made. Like I've already got some bookings for next year of guest exhibitor at a quilt show. They often profile one person and I've been invited to display at one of them next year. So I don't want to sell my very special ones right. because I need to take them with me. And we use them too. They're not just um, for looking at. We use them on the beds in winter. Right. You mentioned the Facebook groups, like, and that you're also like active on Instagram. What does social media do for you? Like how oh, do you use it? It connects me with an awful lot of people all around the world that, you know, 20 years ago, we really couldn't have ever known what's going on in all these other places. It provides me with endless inspiration of colors, designs, patterns, and opens up new techniques, new styles of quilting and embroidery. Um, especially the embroidery, like, um, I've connected with some Russian people because I loved what they were doing and they ran a stitch along. And because it's all diagram based, it didn't even matter that I couldn't speak the language. I could follow what they were doing and downloaded the patterns and pretty much kept up. So it's amazing what can occur through social media. Do you, um, so I saw you did this Christmas village. Uh, oh yes. Um, do you, and, and also you, you have the Halloween haunted house, I saw. Yes. So you, you create like holiday themed embroidery, basically pieces. Is that something you just started doing or you, you add to the collection of those? Oh, that's been going for about 10 years. I actually Googled how to decorate oh, a gingerbread house because we were making one we bought a kit at the shop and we were just decorating with lollies out sweets and um, up popped this embroidered gingerbread house. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I'd never made anything 3D before from embroidery, but I, I guess I've always had this thing about, well, if someone's done it and there's instructions, I could figure out, I could do this. So I sent away for the pattern and um, yeah, so 10 years ago, I, th I think it's nearly 10 years ago, I made my first gingerbread house. And then since then, the designer, Victoria Sampler, has released a lot more patterns, including the Halloween, the haunted house. So I just made one a year as they came out. And I'm on my last one now, the flower shop. And it's not finished yet, and it won't be finished for this Christmas, but hopefully for next Christmas. <laughs> When you store your quilts, how do you, like, where do you keep them all? Ah, uh, yeah, well, it used to be in cupboards and spread across the bedrooms and all. But now, just about one year ago, I bought a bookcase or sort of a shelving system that um, we put in one of the bedrooms. And I fold the quilts and put them up the top of that shelving system now apart from the ones that are in use in the bedrooms oh and I have a quilt ladder which is a um a display mechanism in the hall a lot of people have a quilt ladder quilters to and they change the quilts on display on the ladder so I see that each time as I walk up the stairs how often do you change that um every couple of months yeah because when I finish something new I want it on the ladder to see it properly right do you have a favorite, like something you would, like you consider your masterpiece, you would never part this? Oh, either my Pasakali quilt from a few years ago or the newer 
the one I made after that called Fireworks, I love both of them there. Um, they were both English paper pieced and hand quilted. And really, I put a lot of effort into balancing the colors. I love the way they show the consistency of color throughout. And they both include a lot of colors, but I was very restrained and didn't just drop in anything because I liked it, it had to fit. Right. Well, you mentioned that you do these talks and I saw that you won multiple awards for your quilts and like different exhibitions. Are you ever under pressure to like finish something for the, there's like deadline to enter stuff into competitions and things like that? Yes. <laughs> Um, there was a show last year in May, and I really didn't, in New, within New Zealand, I really didn't expect that we would have to send the quilts in February, and I had two that I was intending to enter, and I just didn't, oh no, it wasn't that we had to send them, it's that we had to submit photographs of the finished quilts in February, and uh, I got back from my Christmas holidays and it was the heat of summer in January and February here and I had to hand quilt these quilts with woolen batting in the middle and yeah I was doing that every day um, I was under the pump for that because different shows have different entry methods some you have to send a photo there's like pre-judging the a juried show it's called meaning that the judges look at all the photographs and only select a certain number to actually go to the show right. where others are just open entry and everybody who belongs to that guild can enter if it's your guild local guild show they try to exhibit everybody's work because it's about community and everybody having a chance to display something they've made they're more likely to say everybody can enter one and if we get too many your second choice might not get to be displayed with these other ones um the new zealand wide show wanted to look at everybody's quilt first and only select the ones they thought were the very best and had a chance of winning a prize so that caught me out of it <laughs> but, <laughs> well, do you remember winning first time yes yes <laughs> What was that? Oh, very surprised. Um, I was in Sydney, Australia, and for my Pasakali quilt. And it was a massive show, like 400 quilts. And we'd all walked around in the morning and admired so many beautiful quilts. And as they went through the prizes, they start at the very, well, the bottom of the list with the school children. And then they worked their way up, up, up. And when they got to my category, I won a merit prize. And I thought, well, that's great. It's lovely to be recognized because there's a lot of quilts in this category, maybe 40 or 50 quilts in my category. And then, um, so we moved through that category and we got right up. There were only three prizes remaining. And I won one of the final three prizes for the best amateur quilt. And I was stunned that they called my name. <laughs> It was wonderful. And people are so kind. These people who I'd never even met before, they were all coming up to me afterwards saying, oh, congratulations. And it was fantastic. Well, what happens if you don't win? Like, are you disappointed at this point, like in your quilting career, so to say? Um, a, a little bit disappointed inside, but then also you've got to look around the room and look at what did win and think, well, actually, that is stunning and I probably would have given the prize to that one too or um you there's also different shows have different natures different um emphasis different purpose and just because you don't win in one show doesn't mean your quilt's not worthy or you're not worthy you could enter that in another show and win best in show it's and I mean, I didn't make them to win prizes anyway. I make them because I love making them. I love looking at them. I love having them. I really make them for my own joy, not for winning a prize. Right. 
do you ever get creative blocks like when you don't feel like doing anything or when you don't know what to do next no I don't really have that problem I know other people talk about that but maybe it's because I've got so many hobbies so many forms of crafting quilting embroidery knitting there's always something that um I like and can find to do so like besides those uh, few weeks when you had inflammation of your finger and you couldn't uh, do anything with your hands, are there like days when you don't do any fiber arts? Not usually, unless I'm out. <laughs> um, unless I'm out at meetings or super busy with work, I usually have time or make time to do something because I do it in the evening as well after dinner, um, a few hours watching TV and doing a craft. So you mentioned that you take your quilting with you on the go, like those pieces yeah. and you work on them like on the bus or like or the airplane or wherever you go. Does that strike conversation with total strangers? Like does that attract a lot of interest? Sometimes. Um, I've had a couple of air hostesses say to me, oh, what are you making? <laughs> and say, oh, I'm, I've started quilting and oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah, mainly just the air crew, not so much other people. I mean, I don't, it's not that I'm doing it every day, every place, but on an aeroplane, when it's at least an hour long it just seems so boring looking well it's not boring looking out the window but it's wasted time <laughs> it could be doing something right um how is your family looking at all the stash and all the tools and all the patterns pattern books and all this accumulation of quilts like are they super supportive of you um yes they um they're happy that I'm happy and each of my family have their own hobbies and interests and you know my husband's into sports and cars and things and my two sons are into computer gaming they've bought many gaming consoles games devices <laughs> So we've each got our own hobbies. And um, fortunately, um, my husband's got a good job. I've got a part-time job. Fortunately, we can afford to do the things that we enjoy. Right. If they were to give you a gift, would it be fiber arts related gift? Oh, they, um, they wouldn't buy without asking me <laughs> if it was fiber arts. They would say... Um, I would choose, I would tell them, well, I'd order it and tell them you can give me this for Christmas or my birthday. And they'll go, oh, that's fine. Great, sorted. So I also saw that you make like quilting bags and like other oh, yes. not, not just flat quilts. How do you decide on those projects? Like how often do you do those projects in comparison to quilts? Um, bag making... Handmade bags are beautiful, but they are hard work. And I sort of thought, should I make another one this summer? It seems to be about a year between me making a bag. And uh, there's a, I just can't really be bothered struggling with the, it's called soft and stable. Soft in, in for noddy, stable. It's a foam that you put in the bags that makes them stand up by themselves, but is still flexible. It's hard pushing it through the sewing machine when you're sewing multiple layers together. Bags, they look lovely. I probably will make another one next year because we're having our big quilting symposium in New Zealand. And one of the challenges is for the best bag. And, um, I don't expect to win, but it's fun to see everybody with unique handmade bags. You know, at conventions, people used to give out bags for all attendees, a convention loot bag when you arrive with directions and vouchers and all of that. 
we're trying to be a bit more sustainable and saying, everybody bring your own bag and we'll give you a prize for the most unique bag, spot prizes. That's actually so I need clever. to come up with an idea and make a bag. Well, so what's going on in your head when you hand sewing when you're quilting like what are you thinking about are you like planning the next quilt are you thinking what you're going to make for dinner like what <laughs> yes and many things um gosh definitely what are we going to have for dinner do i need to go to the shop again um yeah a whole range of things um looking at the fabrics, the colors. Yes, I am thinking ahead to future quilts. Um, gosh, that's a hard one. <laughs> well, when you're planning the next quilt, like is there ever some like long, long term, some dream, some idea that like one day I'm gonna put everything aside and I'm gonna make this quilt? Like, do you have any dream quilt in the thinking? That's interesting because I know there's a, some people think that a Dear Jane quilt is their ultimate. Um, you possibly know more about Dear Jane than me. It's an American thing, I think. A lady who came to America, Jane Sickle, I think. And it's a sampler type quilt with many different blocks in it. And people have done it in all sorts of different color ways. And some people I know here in New Zealand think that that's their ultimate goal, but I really don't have any interest in making a dead Jane, so it won't be that. I don't have anything at the moment on my mind that's my ultimate make. I just like to see what comes along and um, yeah, take it one day at a time. Right. Well, when, like, I know that, like, a lot of rug weavers, they weave a story into the rug. So each element has some meaning, and basically, like, people who know how to sort of read rug, right, they can tell the story that's woven into a rug. Is there the same thing for you in quilting? Like, do you have a story that you're trying to set, tell with the quilt? No. Um... I guess if I had fabrics, I think it's different. Like when I was a child, my mum made us a picnic quilt and that included pieces of skirts and various homemade clothes from over the years. And that I remember sitting on that picnic quilt and having special squares that I always sought out because I like those fabrics. But now that we don't really make our own clothes anymore, I don't have um, that kind of strong connection to weave through. Like I know um, this quilt behind me, I can remember, only I know this though, I know where I was when I made some of those blocks. I remember sitting at various holiday locations, stitching that or having it laid out on the floor at an apartment we were staying at somewhere. So I can have my personal memories woven in, but no one else will see that I know where I was when I made part of that. So when you go away on holidays, are you always visiting fabric stores? Oh, um. Not really. Um, I'm quite lucky where I live in Wellington, New Zealand. This is, there are big fabric stores here, like two of the key ones in New Zealand are here. And another one in Auckland is very close to where my parents live. So I try to go to the one near my parents' house. But in other parts of New Zealand, I don't really there's not the same level of variety in those shops as we've got here, I don't think. Yeah. I don't, in Australia, um, in Sydney, I would definitely go to Material Obsession. It's quite close to the city. 
And in Melbourne, I went to Amity Textiles, which is way down past Geelong. But we were staying in Geelong the last time I went there. So that is a fantastic shop like a destination shop now has a cafe and everything so you could spend half a day there easily um but other places no i don't really other countries it's hard like i've been to singapore i never went to i don't even know if they have a quilt shop there because um it's too much time just if you're only there for five days to spend half a day trundling to a quilt shop that may not have a great variety. Yeah. I think if I went to America again, I'd, um, well, when I've been to America, it's only been to Los Angeles and San Diego and Hawaii. So, and none of them, I don't think I was even really into quilting them, but I wouldn't have asked the rest of the family to forsake half a day or even a full day to find a quilt shop there. But I think if I went um, to Houston, definitely. Right. <laughs> Well, when you meet other quilters and you see their work, are you inspired? Do you try to look at like how they did the, like the technical side of it? Do you see the mistakes that they made? Do you see what you're doing better than they do? Like, how do you look at other people's quilts? Oh, um, at an exhibition, at an exhibition, they're all good quilts because the organisers wouldn't hang anything that they think is not really worthy. They might quietly speak to the quilter and say, look, really, um, you know, I think it would be best if you didn't hang this one. But most people know that and wouldn't even enter if it's not up to standard. It's hard, every time you look at someone else's quilt, Initially, you think, oh, it's fantastic. And I mean, we don't go around an exhibition looking for faults. So I guess if there's anything I might say, oh, okay, I would have done that in different colors, or I would have made more contrast between the lights and the darks. Oh, that's interesting, but you know, I don't, I have no desire to make one like that myself it's more those kind of comments of being neutral about stuff rather than instantly saying oh gosh that's you know <laughs> it's bad right well so in knitting a lot of people like the process of knitting but then when it's time to like do the finishing work they might send it to the local yarn store to be stitched together or stuff like that or blocked is there like a task in quilting that you would rather give to somebody else if it was a choice like is there anything that you're not loving about quilting <laughs> well when you've cut all the pieces and sewn them together then come some people refer to that as patchwork but I mean, really these days, I think we call it all quilting. It's just the piecing part of quilting. In the actual quilting, so I'm a hand quilter. I prefer to hand quilt. I will machine quilt if the object is small, like a table runner or a baby quilt. But if it's anything bigger than that and I want it machined quilted, I've only got my domestic sewing machine. I haven't got a long arm quilting machine. So there are people who specialize in long arm quilting and you can take it to them and you discuss with them what pattern you want on it, whether you want an all over design, some call that edge to edge. You could pick a flowery, swirly design and then you pick what color cotton you want them to use with thread. And they just load it up and it's com a computer driven machine and they press the button and it goes for a couple of hours and then it's finished and you pay them and take it home and put on the binding and it's done then there's another form of that called custom quilting where you say yes i want you to put it on your big machine where it's all flat and straight and you can see what's happening but we want hand guided where you um do either motifs or just straight freehand or with a ruler 
highly detailed, precise um, quilting to match the blocks or to accentuate. Like if you had a face in a big block and you wanted, you didn't want the sewing going over the face, they could just stitch around the edge of the face and um, raise it up. So again, you pay someone to do that. And sometimes I do do that. Um, I've probably had three or four quilts quilted by a local long arm quilter this year. Because um, like for my son's 21st quilt, I thought giving a young man a hand quilted quilt that needs a bit more care long term and care with washing I don't really want that. I want it machine quilted so it's easy to go in the washing machine if it needs to be washed or when it needs to be washed. And also the one I gave away as a wedding quilt, I had that machine quilted too because hand quilting is another few months on top of the piecing side of quilting. And I think, you know, once again, you know, you're giving it to people who uh, you are they going to throw it on the back of the sofa are they you know it could be all used in all sorts of ways and I didn't mind what they do with it they can put it in the car and use it as a picnic quilt if they want but machine quilting stands up better to long-term use like that do you have uh, a concept of uh, quilt worthy people like who in your mind is quilt worthy oh uh, <laughs> Um, people who I know and mm, yeah, people, it's a hard one, <laughs> uh, relatives, friends, but most of my friends are quilters too, so they make their own quilts, but, um, this young couple, get, a wedding quilt seemed like a very nice gift to people who were already living together and didn't want pots or sheets or any of the towels, those kind of wedding gifts. A quilt was a unique, special gift. Do you feel like, okay, I'll, ask, I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. So every time I'm showing something I needed to my husband, he looks at it and he goes, oh, that's nice, dear, right? But then if I show the same exact thing to a knitter, fellow knitter who is a friend, they see the whole difficulty level, they understand the complexity of the garment, they understand the amount of time and the amount of skill that went into making of that. Do you have the same thing with quilting? Like when you show it to your just friends, right? Versus your quilting friends, do you get the same interaction difference? Um, yes, because, um, well, most of my friends know that I choose complex designs and they can see how many pieces, how many different colors are in it. And um, most of my friends know how long things, I've been working on things. So they are full of praise when I finish something. Yes. So when you, when you approach the new quilt, does it like is there any technique that scares you something that you would stand away from or do you feel like if anybody can do it I can do it no I feel I'm not very good at applique yet which is sewing pieces onto the surface of a flat background like leaves and flowers and that applique flowers there's there's a lot of different ways of applique like some people do it on the sewing machine they just do a very tight zigzag over the edge that's raw a raw edge applique I want to do needle turn where you fold the seam allowance under and have a very nice smooth edge and you almost invisibly stitch it on by hand but I feel I'm not particularly good at that yet I'm still practicing. I've got one quilt I'm working on that is meant to be my practice piece. And I have got better over the time of doing that quilt, but I still have a very big pattern in the cupboard that I want to do when I get better at it. <laughs> well, I also noticed like you had one post where you said that a certain quilting designer recommends to practice every day the freehand stitching on the machine. Oh something and and you said well to ask me if I do that no I don't 
like yeah. is, <laughs> talking about getting better like is that something you plan as well for the next year like do you say okay I'm gonna next year I'm gonna work on this technique and this technique and learn that skill or is it like whenever that is gonna happen it's gonna happen I did a couple of years ago decide that I was going to really try hard on the hand piecing to move away from the English paper piecing because the English paper piecing where you wrap the fabric around papers, cardboard papers, that was hurting my hands a lot. That I was gripping too hard with my left hand, the two pieces together, I was stabbing the needle through with my right hand and it just felt very small tight stitches and I thought oh this isn't good I should move to hand piecing which looks more relaxing and it's also quicker in the long run because with that English paper piecing these days we glue the papers we glue the fabric onto the papers and there's that whole extra step and the people, especially from Holland, who have hand pieced forever, they sort of go, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? And we would say, oh, it's to get the precision. And they'd say, but we can get the precision with hand piecing. We don't need these cardboard pieces and all the glue and those extra steps you're adding into the process. So I just decided okay, this year I'm really going to try on the hand piecing. And of course, it was slow at first. I think that's the problem when you're quite quick at stitching. Okay. To try a new way, you've got to accept there's going to be downtime. There's, you're going to be a lot slower for the first few weeks, months, even um, possibly a whole year it took me to get up to speed on the hand piecing. But in the long term, it's better for me to do the hand piecing than the English paper piecing. Right. Why did you decide to do the YouTube channel? Oh, a lot of people said to me, oh, your stars look so good. Can you do a video? And um, I was a bit reluctant because um, New Zealanders and Australians, we have a unique accent down here. And I thought most most quilters live in America. That's a fact. And I thought they'll all say, oh God, what's she saying? But um, it's a bit like those Russian embroidery things. It was mainly looking at the pictures, watching my hand, what my hands were doing, not so much my voice. So I just did it. And it's not produced to top level or anything. It's just me at home. Today's the day I'm doing it. <laughs> so I did it. Was it... Uh, nerve-wracking to like film yourself oh um I asked my son to film it wasn't no not really nerve-wracking because I knew I'd look at it and if I didn't like it we'd have to do a second take or a third take I wrote down the script in advance and had a little practice to myself about what order am I going to do this I actually loved watching that. <laughs> like, oh, I, thank you. I spent today the whole day, like just watching it. I felt like it was very like relaxing, and it's uh, very like interesting to see you doing, making all those tiny stitches, and you know, something uh, I was really interested in learning at some point, maybe. Well, thank you. A lot of um, the YouTube videos on how to do quilting are filmed in studios with proper lighting and cameras, and the presenters are all beautifully made up and they've had their nails done and everything and I was just like I'm just going to do this and pop it up and if 50 people watch it that's fine and of course a lot more than that have watched it but um I wasn't going to go hiring a studio or anything to make a little video now you know what I've learned in my short YouTube career that there is a room for everybody and every style and every accent out there right <laughs> good <laughs> so I'm sure there's like an audience for you and your quilting techniques as well yes. yeah well I love talking to you I love getting to know you today thank you so much Wendy for being my guest the guest of my channel today and oh, thank you very much for asking me it's been a pleasure <laughs> we're gonna put all the information to your YouTube channel your Instagram and all your information in the description of the video so people can find you and follow you and see all your beautiful quilts. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.